Well, if you have a Bible, and I I hope you do, would you turn to Mark chapter 4? We're going to be looking at verses 35 through 41 today. This is the story of where Jesus calms the storm on the sea. If you're of a certain age, and probably that age is one that has more gray hair than less, you probably know the line, who was that masked man, quite well. You might have first heard it on the radio and then on TV, and uh, you know that that's a line that came regularly in the show The Lone Ranger. And how the situation worked was that uh, the Lone Ranger would save the day and rescue the good people from the bad guys, and at the end of that, uh, the good people would go to to thank the Lone Ranger for the way in which he's rescued them, and, and yet he had already slipped away on his horse. And uh, you would uh, hear that line, Who was that masked man? And then you would hear Lone Ranger say, hi Silver, away. And then uh, that was uh, the end of the show, usually the end of the episode. If you're of a different generation, of course, you know all sorts of superheroes that have alternative identities. You think about Superman, for example. How strange it is that when Superman was, took off his super suit and he put on a, a regular suit and a pair of glasses, that nobody could recognize the, him, that he was Clark Kent, and that was indeed Superman. Or you remember perhaps uh, Bruce Wayne, who it's a little more understandable that people didn't recognize him as he would put on his Batman suit and uh, rescue the good guys from the bad guys or stop the villains. Yeah, they have others like Brent Peter Parker, who was uh, Spider-Man, or Bruce Banner, who is the Incredible Hulk. And uh, we could go on naming the superheroes and their secret identities. I I wish you were here, because if you were, then I would give you a little pop quiz, and I would name the, the character, and you could tell me what superhero they were. But there's another superhero of sorts and um, uh, that probably was, was about hard to identify for many people in his day, and even continues to be very difficult for many people to identify his true identity. And of course, you know I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Now, I know he's not a superhero like Superman or Batman or Spider-Man, but just play along with me a little bit. Jesus is indeed the hero of history. He's the one who, who, who rescues us from our deepest need, from our deepest darkness, which is sin and death. And he's a way who, he is the one who uh, rescued us and liberated us so that one day we could experience the new heavens and new earth with him for forever and ever. And the tragedy is that in Jesus' day, many people... Many of his own people did not recognize him, and that's true even today. Many people do not recognize his true identity. Jesus, uh, however, did not try to keep his identity secret for the most part. There's times, as we'll get into the Gospel of Mark, where he asks that they not tell anybody what he did for somebody. But for the most part, Jesus did not come to hide his identity, but to reveal his identity. And that identity, of course, is God in the flesh. God in the flesh. And Jesus was going public when he came to earth to reveal who he was to them. In the next three times that we look at the Gospel of Mark, we're going to actually be looking at three miracles of Jesus where Jesus is doing just that. He's revealing his identity. He's revealing who he is through what he does. Ted Vansel a couple of weeks ago preached a great message from John where Jesus turned water into wine and he noted how those miracles are, are uh, like an undercover cop revealing their badge and showing their, their authority, showing who they really are. And that's how Jesus is doing here in these three miracles. He's revealing who he really is. And we're going to see that Jesus is indeed God in the flesh in these three stories. And he's revealing his authority over three realms. So the first week today, we're going to be seeing that Jesus reveals his authority over nature, over the the wind and the sea that he has power and authority over. Next time, we will see how Jesus reveals his authority over the demonic realm as we see Jesus drive out a demon. And then when we see this last section in chapter 5, verses 21 through 43, we're going to see Jesus show his authority over sickness and even over death as he heals one woman and he raises another young uh, girl from the dead. And all of these stories together are to show one message and they answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is that masked man? Who is he? And we're going to see that Jesus is revealing himself to be 
God in the flesh. So let's read Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And listen carefully, this is the word of the Lord. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with him in the boat, and just as he was, and the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this great passage of Scripture. It's a great reminder of your power, your authority over all things in the natural realm. We pray now, Father, that your Holy Spirit, wherever the people listening to this are at, would just illuminate their hearts and their minds, encourage them, teach them, instruct them, and just I pray, Lord, that you challenge them in their faith. And I pray through this, Lord, we would grow become one degree more like your Son, Jesus Christ, than we are today because of our encounter with your Word. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to divide this passage of Scripture kind of under three headings. And um, all of them, I, headings, all of these headings, these sections, kind of, I think, teach us a bit of a lesson. So the first lesson is in verses 35 to 38, which is lessons from the storm. Second lesson will be in verse 39, which will be lessons from the calm. And then the final one will be lessons from the rebuke, which is in verses 40 and 41. So first, let's look at lessons from the storm. In verses uh, 35 and 36, we see here that Jesus uh, kind of goes across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We know from the context here that Jesus, in chapter 4, had just been teaching them many things in parables. And uh, he had done probably more parables than Mark records. We might envision several hours of teaching, perhaps. Well, whatever the thing is, uh, there was a great crowd that had gathered around Jesus. And because of that, it says in chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus had gotten onto a boat and just had pushed the boat a little ways into water so that he could kind of use that as his floating pulpit, so to speak, and he could speak to people in this great crowd without being crushed or overtaken by them. And so after Jesus gets done teaching about the kingdom through these parables, it says in verses 35 and 36 that now they set off. Probably they don't go back to shore. They just set off from where they're at and they go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, we have no idea why it is that Jesus wanted to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee at this time. We could take a little bit of a guess that maybe what Jesus wanted to do was just to get a little bit of space, get a little bit of rest. He has been with people continuously, and he needs just a little bit of time to get some, some sleep and some rest. Uh, probably some of you who are in whatever day we're in now, uh, what is it, 13 or so on this 15 days of uh, social distancing, some of you are feeling very trapped inside, and then the Minnesota governor as well, who is adding this, uh, uh, this um, shelter-in-place order until April 10th, you're, you're getting a little bit stir-crazy because you're not able to be out and about like you want to be. The people you love so dearly are becoming very, very annoying to you. Even your cat and your dog, which you love probably just as much, maybe more than the people <laughs> that are in your life, even they are becoming a little bit annoying as they nudge you and, and jump on you and just want to be pet and touched all the time. Well, we will get through this, but um, I wonder if Jesus, just being with people, just, just, just constantly being with people needs to have a little bit of disconnection just to go to the other side, get a break, do some teaching in another location. Uh, it says here that they are on a boat, and uh, of course, many of you fishermen out there want to know what kind of boat. It's not a Lund boat. It's not a speed boat. Uh, actually, they did some interesting, uh, they made an interesting archaeological discovery in 1986 about a fishing boat very similar to what probably Jesus would have been in and used in that era, the fishermen of that day. The boats are about 26, 27 feet long. 
They're about seven or eight feet wide. They're about four or five feet tall. And they said this fishing boat would have been rowed by four different people in the boat, two in each side, running the oars. And then uh, this boat probably could have contained about 15 people. So you think about Jesus' disciples being 12 of them. And then Jesus, here you got 13 people. You got a pretty full boat making their way across the Sea of Galilee. Now it says, though, that while they were making their way across, in verse 37, it says, suddenly, all of a sudden, a great storm arises. It's a surprise to them, which probably indicates uh, a couple of things. One is, is that we do know that on the Sea of Galilee, sudden storms often do arise, and that's partially because the Sea of Galilee is about 700 feet below sea level, and the surrounding area is much higher elevation. Mount Hermon, for example, which is very close to that area, is about 9,000 feet above. So you have uh, this kind of situation where a lot of hot and cold are meeting. But even with that, you know, there's, there's perhaps some ways to see some indications if something's coming up. Remember that some of Jesus' disciples are former fishermen. They're probably very, very aware of the conditions and what to look for. Notice it makes that strange comment in verse 36 as well that other boats were there with him that may be just a recollection. Remember that uh, Mark uh, traditionally has been understood to be Mark recording down what Peter was recalling. And so maybe it's just an eyewitness detail that Peter had. Or it could be that the other fishermen who uh, would have been well aware of the signs of, uh, of a storm brewing they saw no signs of it, and so they took out onto the water as well. And so this is a, a big, big surprise and very, very terrifying. Now, I grew up in a fishing area, and we had Lake Winnie on one side of us and Lake uh, Leech Lake on another side of us. And um, I never got in a situation where I was uh, really scared or I found it to be very dangerous when I was on a boat on the water during a, a sudden storm. But I did hear a few stories every now and then of people that are on the opposite side of the lake getting trapped, uh, finding a storm suddenly arising that they didn't anticipate, and they were scared, scared generally for their lives and whether their boat would capsize and they would be drowned. And I imagine that's where the disciples are at right here. And so they are panicking in this situation. They're probably trying to scoop as much water and, and throw it out of the boat as the boat is filling as fast as they can. But they asked themselves, where's Jesus? Did we lose him? Where is he? They're looking for him, as I picture it, in the boat. Is he frantically flipping water out of the boat with them? Instead, no. Jesus is in the stern of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. That's an odd response. Why? Well, simply put, he's probably very exhausted. He's been teaching and preaching. I preach one sermon on Sundays, and I'm usually shot for the rest of the day. <laughs> I can imagine Jesus doing several hours of teaching and being and interacting with people that he is very, very tired. But it might also be that Jesus is sleeping because he has a view of his father's care and love and sovereignty over his life that the others did not share. It speaks many times in the Old Testament of the one who trusts in the Lord is blessed with the ability to sleep, resting in the knowledge that God is protecting them. Psalm 4, verse 8 says, In peace I will lie down, and peace for you alone, O Lord, make me, you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Or for Proverbs 3, verse 24, spoken to the one who is living by God's wisdom, he says, If you lie down, you will not be afraid, and when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Now, I get it a little bit because whenever there's a storm in the middle of summer and the wind comes up and the rain starts pouring, I, I have to be honest with you, I, I often don't wake up. Mara's up there looking at the National Weather Service and seeing if a tornado is headed our way. She's looking out the windows to see if trees and branches are breaking off. She wants to know, should we make shelter in the basement here because, uh, because of this storm that's coming? I don't. I just sleep right through it. I would like to think that's because I have a superior confidence in the sovereignty of God over my life and his care for me. It's not actually that at all. I just sleep very soundly. Whatever the reason here that Jesus is sleeping so soundly, we don't know all of them. But even in their panic, 
they have words that they speak to Jesus, the disciples, that are probably a bit on the harsh, too harsh side. They say in verse 38, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? There's a sense of cynicism. There's a sense of frustration. Can't you see that the boat is filling up with water, Jesus? Can't you come to our rescue? At least pick up a bucket and start dumping water out so that we don't go under. And haven't you felt that way in your own lives at times where you've wondered to yourself, Lord, don't you care about me in this situation? I'm worried sick about this. Uh, have you abandoned me? Are you still here, Lord? Are you still caring about me? But there's something more going on here than just the disciples' imminent fear of death, isn't there? Because in the context, the disciples, remember, have left everything to follow Jesus. They've left family ties. They've left businesses behind. They believed Jesus when he said the kingdom of God is at hand, and they followed Jesus, and they are now at this point of where everything they have risked their lives for, everything that they have... Uh, been concerned about. Everything that um, they have put all their eggs, so to speak, in one basket, and it seems as if all of that is in danger of being destroyed in a single moment unless Jesus comes to their rescue. Now, I want to take a moment just to apply this little section here to our own lives, but I don't want to apply it just individually. I want to apply it I think probably more in line with how Mark would have seen the application to his first readers. Remember that Mark is probably written, at least traditionally it's understood to be written, to Christians living in Rome who are suffering persecution. Remember that Nero burned the city of Rome down and started a fire in the city of Rome for the purpose of him being able to rebuild the city to his own likes and specifications. But in the process of that, he also made the Christians a scapegoat. He blamed the fire on them. He said they're the ones that started the fire. And because of that, it erupted in a lot of persecution for Christians in that age, especially in Rome. Many Christians were forced out of their homes in Rome. They were forced to find other homes. And they probably were thinking at some point, what's the point in following Jesus? Does Jesus even care about my des our despair and our struggle? Can the persecuted church prevail against this level of persecution? And can we persevere? And as I mentioned last week, the church of Jesus Christ doesn't seem like much to the world. And it doesn't seem like a lot to a lot of Christians. For many people, it may seem very irrelevant or outdated. It may seem very silly group of people that get together and worship and are religious and all that sort of a thing. And even to many people who are Christians, they're frustrated with the church of Jesus Christ. They're frustrated because they feel like if the church would just do what the church is supposed to do and rise up and serve and, and share the gospel, that the, this Christianity thing could flourish wherever it's at. Then we could really make a difference. Well, if that's how you feel, I think this story reminds us that we're not to lose heart when we feel that the giving of our life to Jesus is somehow a lost cause. In a culture where you feel like every other religion is growing faster, like Islam and Wicca and New Age and agnosticism and atheism and, and uh, even those who are now checking the box, none, when it comes to their religious filiation, when it feels like uh, being a Bible-believing Christian becoming a strange thing in this world where the things you believe and hold dear to are being ostracized by many in the culture. Uh, it, 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 sometimes you maybe feel not at home in the United States even because you feel like the culture has shifted and it's not where you're at anymore. You may be tempted in those moments to ask yourself, what's the point? What's the point of the church? It's so weak. What's the point of being a Christian? We're just on the on the uh, losing end of things. We're about to watch this church in, in the world sink to its, to its grave. We're about to file for chapter 11 in the process of the church because it doesn't, it doesn't have the power. It doesn't have the stamina. What's the point of all of this? But one of the most important things I think that this account reminds us of is that the kingdom of God depends upon a king who has the power and the authority to see that his kingdom is established. In this 
COVID-19 outbreak, Jesus' church will prevail. It can even be an opportunity for believers to model through their faith in Jesus Christ the fearlessness they have in the face of life and death and the love that they have, even for people that don't love them or love their Savior, Jesus Christ, to show love to them because Jesus loved us while we were enemies of the cross. That message, that sort of thing will indeed prevail. There's a lesson there for us to learn out of this uh, storm that's here. But then we turn to the second lesson, which is in verse 39, which is a lesson from the calm. And this is where Jesus uh, comes into clear focus. It's kind of like the camera just zooms in on Jesus and we get a clear focus of his identity that is vital for us to understand in this passage. In verse 39, Jesus awakes from his sleep. He gets up and he rebukes the wind and the sea, and he says, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And all of God's people and everyone reading this story is supposed to say, Wow, that was sure easy. How did that happen so easily? And that's the point. This is not some uh, uh, difficult thing for Jesus to handle. He handles it with just a command, a rebuke. Now, some people have read this story and they've wondered to themselves um, if this might be a demonically inspired storm. And the reason they say that is because Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. If you're going and walking around and you stub your toe on the kitchen table, you don't rebuke the table and and slap it and say, I rebuke you. you. You say, ouch, or something like that. Um, or I have known a few people that uh, if there is a, a frustration with their car or with a tool or with a situation in which they try to curse or rebuke that item, but most of the time we save our rebukes for people, not things. And because of that, and also because in the Gospel of Mark, we see many times where uh, Jesus Um, um, rebukes, and every time he uses that language of rebukes, Jesus is rebuking a demonic spirit, a demonic being. And so some take those two things together and say, see, this is a demonically stirred up storm. Now, I don't know. There's probably some validity to that or some uh, uh, value in in seeing it that way. I'm not 100% sure it really matters with how we deal with the things we face. And what I mean by that is, is whether this is a demonic thing, or whether this is just a natural thing. Indeed, Jesus is showing his power and authority over both. You know, I've never been a huge fan of attributing demonic attack, satanic attack, spiritual warfare quickly to things that are just could be a variety of different explanations to it. For example, I've had a few challenges over the past couple of weeks of just figuring out this new technological world of uploading videos to YouTube. Um, I, uh, I've gotten it kind of smoothed out, I think, for the most part now. We'll see how this video goes. But at the same juncture, uh, there was not any point in there where I thought, Satan is stopping me from getting it uploaded to YouTube. That's not generally the way I think. It's probably just my own stupidity in using technology. It could be. Maybe Satan is trying to cause a little static in my life in order to frustrate me from spreading the message of the Word of God uh, to to all of you. That's possible. But either way, whether it's a, a my own foolishness or whether it's a technological glitch or whether it's or it's Satan behind it, my response was the same. Lord, please let me figure this out so that I can become fluid in this and, and proficient in this and use this medium for future opportunities to share the gospel. Yeah, however, I lean in this text here of saying that this was not a demonically inspired storm. And the part of it is, is because very often in the Old Testament, the winds and the seas are spoken of as if they are personal beings that God himself rebukes or commands or speaks to. And I think in one particular passage specifically, and if you want to look this up, you can, out of Psalm 104, verses 23 through 32, is a really important passage. It's almost like a prophecy of this event in some ways, written in advance. Let me read it to you. Psalm 107, 23 through 32. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. 
They went down to the depths, their courage melted in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation and the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. And I believe this is very much behind much of what's uh, being spoken of here in Mark chapter 4. The point of Jesus calming the wind and the waves is that he is doing something that only God in the Old Testament is spoken of as doing. This is Jesus flashing his God badge to them. This is, this is G the disciples having a sneak peek, a revelation of who this Jesus really is. And that's why the disciples in verse 41, after all of this, say, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And spoiler alert, we know Jesus is God in the flesh. And that's why I think we can have such incredible comfort in times of distress by turning to Jesus. We don't have a weak Savior. We have a powerful Savior who is sovereign over any of the storms of life that we find ourselves in. And whatever the origin of the storm, whether it was Satan or whether it was a weather pattern, Jesus planned to use this to reveal to his disciples his power and his authority. And I would say that he does this in our lives as well today. He uses situations to teach us about the limits of ourselves and to teach us about our need of dependence upon him. You know, all this talk in the news about COVID-19 and all these things, I've heard so many times by doctors and different political leaders saying something like, we can beat this if we band together and fight this enemy. And I want to say to them, that's not the key. That's not the key. It's not about amassing all of the human abilities and ingenuities and scientific knowledge and therefore banding together to, to beat this. That's not it at all. If anything, I think COVID-19 reveals to us that a coronavirus can actually cause us great harm and actually great havoc in our nation and in our economy and panic among our people. If anything, this reveals just how pathetically frail and vulnerable we really are in this world. If it's not this, it's something else. And it reminds us that we need a Savior. We need God. We need somebody to rescue us in this moment. And there's one point when the Apostle Paul was at a situation in life, not facing COVID-19, but he was in a situation in his life that he says that very thing, that God brought him to a place of absolute dependence so that he had nowhere to turn but God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Now, if that struggle and that lesson is something that the Apostle Paul had to learn, I think it's something, friends, that we have to learn all the time, again and again and again, bringing us to the end of ourselves to the point where maybe we even despair of life itself, like Paul said, but where we have to realize that we have nowhere to turn except to trust God to rescue us, Jesus to come to be our hero, our superhero, to rescue us from our plight. Jesus is the one who can calm the storm. He is the one who has the power and authority to do so. And then lastly, I think from this story, we learn a lesson from we learned a lesson from the storm. We learned a lesson from the calm. We learned a lesson also from the rebuke. This is just very briefly here. In verses 40 and 41, we learn a, a lesson from the rebuke. In verse 40, Jesus not only rebukes here the wind and the, way, and the sea, he also rebukes his own disciples. He says, why are you so afraid? Have you still have no faith? I mean, these guys had witnessed a lot of pretty miraculous things already. 
They had seen exorcisms. They had seen healings. They had seen Jesus teaching some incredible things. And yet they still were afraid when the wind and the sea were threatening them. They were, in a sense, spiritual teenagers who were still learning the process of trusting him in this. Faith is the defining mark of the true disciple, and it should increase uh, and as and who should increasingly be able to respond to crisis with confidence in God's power, authority, and love for us. Let me say that again. Faith is the defining mark of a true disciple who should increasingly be able to respond to crisis with confidence in God's power, authority, and love for us. But as it is for us, as it was for the disciples, it sometimes takes time and opportunities in facing crisis and consistently responding to those crises with faith rather than fear and trust rather than panic. That's where we see the progress that happens in our own spiritual lives. Uh, for most of us, uh, we struggle to put our faith in God. And for most of us, at least in some area, and for most of us, it's a process of learning how to do so. It's we will face again and again with a situation that feels so beyond our control, and we are at a moment where we have a crisis of faith to wonder, are we going to fear or are we going to churn in faith? And we have that opportunity. Each time is like a fork in the road. And each time, if we're going to grow in our faith, it is to say, I turn to God in prayer and trust rather than away from God. I turn to him in confidence in his ability to save me rather than shrink away in fear. And as we do that throughout our lives, that is how we grow in the faith. That's how we make progress so that we have more of a natural response in those moments to trust rather than fear, to put our confidence in him rather than to crumble under the, the weight or the panic. It's like exercise, which I really don't like to exercise. Uh, I, I, I just don't. I don't like to do it. I know I should. I do some of it but I don't probably do as much as I should. But I do know that those people who regularly choose to exercise strengthen their muscles physically, their stamina, their ability to walk longer distances. Or it's like long-distance runners. As they continue to build that stamina up in there, they can go farther and farther and farther without being fatigued, without being crushed by the weight of their, of their weakness. It's the same that is true in our own walk with Christ. As we continually learn to trust, we're building up the spiritual muscles so that it becomes more of our automatic reaction, so that our faith grows and increasingly our confidence in God grows here. When Jesus chastises the disciples, he's not using a shaming technique to manipulate them or to push them into um, trusting him. He's using it as a teaching opportunity. He's saying, why are you so afraid? Think about why you're afraid. What are you afraid of? Think it through. Think it logically. Think yourself clear on this, guys. What are you afraid of? Are you still really not putting your faith in me in this situation? Think about it, guys. And, and indeed, they indeed did grow to be people in their lives who learned to trust God in all situations. And may the strength of our faith, may it grow through these opportunities in these days, to trust him, that which is out of our control. So when Jesus told that wind and that sea, peace be still, what Jesus was doing is revealing himself to be God in the flesh, who has authority, who reigns over the winds and over the waves and the sea. The disciples asked, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? If they will simply reflect on it, he will clearly, they'll clearly see that he is God in the flesh. Jesus is revealing himself. The atheist Bertrand Russell uh, was once asked what he would say to God if he discovered upon his death that God existed and he was wrong. And his sa he said his response would be, I will say, not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. But of course, there is enough evidence. There is enough evidence for those who are looking. Jesus is God in the flesh who demonstrates his reign over the wind and the sea and the waves. He is one who is revealing himself as the God that he claimed to be. 
And thanks be to God that in this turbulent season in which we find ourselves, that Jesus is in the boat with us. He is there. And he will be our strength. He will be our provider. And he will be our savior in whatever challenges we may face in this season or in any season to come in our lives.